Well, everybody, uh, welcome to uh, uh, to Arc Gallery. This is the second of the three artist talks uh, that we will have for this exhibition. We'll be visiting with eight of the artists that are in 48 Pillars. And uh, this exhibition started about five years ago. This is actually the fourth annual. I went down to uh, Flax. I actually wasn't going to Flax. I was at Fort Mason and I was early for something and Flax was open. I walked into Flax and there were uh, these 12 inch by 48 inch panels on closeout sale. And uh, because they were 48 inches, this, and uh, I don't know, the title of the show just popped into my head, 48 Pillars. I went, I bought one of the panels serendipitously and I uh, went back to ARC and I measured the gallery and it seemed that 48 was exactly what fit into the space. And so um, I invited 24 artists to create works on identical 12 inch by 48 inch vertical panels, sent them off to Flax to buy their panels. The first artist came back and said, well, they discontinued the panels. I'm not quite sure what part of closeout sale I hadn't understood. Uh, but fortunately, I had bought one and I was able to uh, contact the manufacturer of the panels uh, and arrange to have a pallet of panels delivered to ARC and everything has been working swimmingly ever since. ARC has uh, shown almost 100 artists in this ser uh, series of exhibitions already. Since we started in 2010, uh, we've shown over a thousand local artists in our space. And uh, that's kind of our mission is to uh, spotlight uh, local art and artists. Uh, so um, we're gonna get started. Uh, all of the artists are gonna talk specifically about their work. Uh, and uh, the first artist that we'll be visiting with uh, this evening is uh, Tyrell Collins. Uh, what particular challenges did this uh, uh, narrow vertical format, 12 inches by 48 inches present to you? How did you resolve that? And uh, separate from the challenges of the format, uh, what inspired your pillars? <clears throat> well, I, I, hi, Michael. Um, I, I would divide the challenges that I had into two parts. Um, the first part is the physical challenge. Um, I wasn't able to use the wood panel because I work on paper and my work has to be framed. Um, and my paper doesn't come in a big enough size. So that was a problem. I, I cast it around and found museum board that comes in 60 by 40 inch sizes. So that turned out to work for me. Um, I have to mount the paper on foam core. So it turned into a very awkward thing to deal with. It was very long. Um, my work is very detailed. You can't really see on the screen. It's um, it's colored pencil and it's made up of little tiny lines. Um, it's very detailed and very slow and this is a lot of territory for me to cover. Um, the second type of challenge was more of a mental challenge for me. And um, that is, I, I did several versions of, of, of the pillars along the year that I was working. Um, most of them were single pieces, not diptychs. I mean, all of them were single pieces. And the last thing I worked on was this diptych. Um, it was so different from the work that I had been doing before that uh, I really wasn't ready to show it. Um, so I got cold feet kind of late in the game and I was casting around trying to figure out what else I could do. Uh, in the end, I, I pushed myself to get this diptych framed I had it in my studio for only a week before I had to hand it over. Um, <laughs> and in that week, I kind of came to terms with it. Um, and uh, as for the inspiration, the inspiration really is the format and the constraints. Uh, my work is usually done horizontally across the paper. Um, the light radiates up and down. And I did several pieces in that way, but I thought I'd be doing myself a disservice not to take advantage of this strange aspect ratio. So I started working on the vertical line um, and created the piece on the left. And I, I liked it so much that I, uh, I realized I was gonna have to do a, a symmetrical companion in order to make it work. 
um, I probably never would have done that if it weren't for this project. Um, but I, you know, I had wanted to move my work forward and I feel that I am moving it forward with this work. Instead of the light radiating up, it's radiating out. And I'm, I'm very appreciative to have had this project so that I could uh, start developing in that direction. So um, I, I just want to remind everybody, there's been a, a number of uh, uh, notices in, in the chat, but if you do have questions for the artist, and I do uh, highly encourage an interactive process here, uh, please type your questions uh, in the chat and we'll relay them uh, to the artist. Um, in the gallery, I mean, Yours is one of the works in particular where uh, the image really doesn't capture uh, uh, the work adequately. I mean, when you're in the gallery and in front of this work, it almost glows. Um, you know, it's, it's got a, a sort of Rothko kind of uh, calming, um, meditative um, uh, feel to it. Uh, but one of the other things I was curious about was the the palette. Uh, you know, one of the things that it reminded me of, and uh, this is probably just me, but there was that, you know, that um, uh, amazing sky after the wildfires where we had night during the day. Um, and it almost feels like light breaking out of that. Um, uh, is there a, an element of light breaking out of darkness here that relates to, to 2020 at all? Well, I think there is that in my work that relating from even before 2020. Um, yeah, the, this work actually developed in 2015, or, yeah, 2015, 2016, when I had a series of losses, incredible series of losses. And this work developed out of the grief that I went through and resolving, you know, renewing, resurrecting. So, you know, and this year has, has likewise been very tough. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, uh, audience would like to know, is your work always this detailed and, and in certain sense minimalist? Yeah, it is. It's, all, it's always been. For my whole career, my work has been very detailed and very minimalist, although it's been different from the work that I'm doing now. And can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, the titles of your work? Uh, the The general title of this body of work is Quantum Entanglement. Um, and then I parenthetically use the colors just so I can keep the pieces straight. Um, the the quantum entanglement is a is a term from physics, um, and I'm interested in physics. I'm not a scientist, but I'm very interested in cosmology, and I'm also interested in metaphysics. Um, quantum entanglement is is a is a, something that's been newly discovered by physics, um, and it, it's complicated, but it's something like this. They have found that if you take something like a photon, a particle, a small you know, atomic particle out of an atom and take it any distance away from that atom, it will continue to relate to the atom. I mean, they, theoretically, you could take that photon to Mars and it would still have a relationship to the atom on Earth. So it's for me, I mean, just metaphorically, um, it suggests connections, interconnections um, that are profound. Um, so I was very struck by that concept and uh, I borrowed it. Well, thank you very much for sharing. And uh, so we're going to move on to uh, the next artist. Uh, Rachel Dawson and uh, uh, Rachel, uh, if you could unmute yourself. And I've got uh, basically the same questions for you. What were the particular challenges of this format for you? How did you resolve those? And then separate from the challenges of the format, uh, what was your inspiration for these pieces? Well, I think uh, for me, um, the challenges kind of came in terms of the formal concerns and working with 
uh, the size of the of the panels. I work typically a lot larger um, and in rectangle or square shapes. Um, so I think I was really thinking about how to arrange the elements of my painting so that there was an overall visual balance as a diptych. Um, but also thinking about how these two pieces could <clears throat> potentially live separately from one another if necessary. Um, I knew that I wanted to work with uh, the Yves Klein paint, which was this special edition paint um, that was created by the Yves Klein estate. And it was uh, a collaboration with a French paint company. And I wanted to use this particular paint. Um, and given the kind of strength of that color, um, I also had to figure out how to give it enough space, um, kind of visual space. So. Um, that was pretty much, I think, I mean, I also think just kind of the challenge of working with that size. I was just, you know, I wanted to take a risk and, um, and just kind of give it a shot, dive right in, if you will. <laughs> um, and then in terms of the second question, what the inspiration was, um, I think, you know, it goes without saying that the last few years, um, and especially this last year, have been really difficult. Um, and about two years ago, I had made this conscious decision to bring color back into my work. Um, I've been working with themes of holes and, and voids and, um, and folds and, and really a black, white and, and gray palette. Um, and thinking about what was going on in the outside of the world, um, in the outside world, and then coming back into my studio and I've been sitting before these kind of black hole paintings. Uh, I, just, I just kind of wanted to bathe in color and, and not black holes. Um, I've always been interested in um, that there are metaphysical properties of color and their ability to evoke a mood. And that really led me to researching how rocks and crystals and minerals have energy. And I, I find it really fascinating that there's these little colorful objects you have purportedly have enough powerful energy to enhance um, or change one's mental or physical state. And I just really wanted to explore that idea more in paint. Um, I also love the, the history of international climb blue and how this hue has a like a palpable energy when you're actually in front of it. It doesn't really come through in this image at all, but um, if you could see it in person, it, it does. And I, I find that this hue particularly has this like otherworldly feel to it, um, but there's also something really unpredictable about it. And, and so I imagine that these, these quartz and citrine crystals were kind of breaking through with, um, you know, with a promise to balance all that is uncertain. Do you, uh, do you feel like uh, this, uh, I mean, this is a pretty, uh, as you said, powerful color. I mean, it's, it's an unusual color uh, in the body of your work. Your work in general is a lot more muted uh, than this. Is this, uh, uh, something that you plan on exploring more in the future? Uh, yeah, I mean, this, uh, with, with this particular color, I mean, the work I'm well, um, even working- Just more popping just color. More just more color. Yeah. Yes. I, um, I find that having worked with such muted colors for so long has really changed the way I perceive color. I feel, I mean, this is a very, um, I mean, I, I think I have a, um, the perception, I guess, is really interesting to me and to see how certain colors vibrate and really um, feeling different in front of, you know, different works of art that have, you know, strong color. Um, and I was just, uh, you know, for my own, my own reasons, just really interested uh, while I work in front of my canvas and like very close to it usually, right? And it's it takes up my whole visual space. And I just found that it had this um, effect on me. And it made me think about how paintings are um, almost like power objects in themselves, right? They have this um, ability to really kind of um, affect people. And, um, and so I was kind of making that connection between, you know, these crystals and, um, and, and painting and color. Um, and so I think that, that that's something I'll continue to explore, um, at least. And for the, the crystals in there it, it, um, seem almost like a sculptural element uh, that sort of ties it back to your uh, past work. Yeah. Um, so I, I, like I said, I've been working a lot with holes and uh, folds and voids and um, for years and years I've been doing that. And I think this really kind of goes into this um, interest where 
I like to um, kind of bridge seeing the unseen with my process of making. Um, I often think about the surface of what we can see and kind of wonder, you know, what's underneath, like what You're unsettling things are going on underneath. Do we know where my no, no, that is not muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and so I think the, the crystals themselves, I think the facets of them, the way they're cut, um really kind of reminded me of um the things that i find interesting in folds and in caverns and kind of looking um uh at, at those things for inspiration okay well thank you so much uh, uh we need to move on to the next one and uh, so i guess next up is elvira Dael. hi elvira. elvira how are you good um, so same questions. What particular challenge did the format present for you and how did you resolve that? And, and separate from that, what was your inspiration for the work? Yeah, um, I mean, I like how uh, in the question itself, there is already sort of a presupposition that there is a challenge and yes, in, in the format. And yes, of course, uh, the sort of the extreme narrowness of, uh, of the panels um, present sort of a um, um, a challenge because I'm one of those artists, and a number of the, a number of uh, uh, artists already mentioned it. Uh, I'm one of those who likes to spread the wings, take as much space as, as I can on the on the surface, but um, and so a little bit more than 12 inches. And so I think from the get go, I knew that uh, it wouldn't be uh, two individual pan panels; it would be a diptych. So 12 inches became two feet, which was you know a little bit more. Um, manageable, but, you know, uh, better. And um, in terms of the sort of verticality, I mean, 48 inches is sort of familiar. I'm uh, working in, in that format a little, a bit larger, a bit um, maybe smaller, but it, within that, so it felt comfortable. Um, and and because I work on paper uh, mostly, and uh, another uh, paper artist already mentioned it, there there are. Um, uh, challenges after sort of overcoming this uh, format challenge, uh, the, the next challenge is to how do you actually, you know, put paper uh, onto these panels. And I had a few ideas in my mind that I sort of few options. Um, so I thought, okay, I can take a 24 by 48 inch uh, paper, um, draw my, my composition uh, in pencil and then cut it in half and uh, adhere them to, to the panels. Uh, I also thought maybe I could, you know, take two individual uh, paper pieces, um, uh, adhere them to the panels and draw with pencil. I also thought maybe I could um, uh, do, do the um, kind of fully complete a pastel drawing uh, on, on uh, separately and then adhere them to the panels. But then this sort of idea is I was worried I might smear the drawing once I try to sort of uh, work it, um, adhere it to, to the panel. So kind of dismiss that idea. And I, and then a final sort of a fleeting thought, I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't torture myself so much with the drawing. I'll just, uh, uh, I won't uh, do pastel, I'll paint the panels and it'll be a painting. But that idea lasted like a, a split second in my mind, I couldn't dismiss it. So in the end, I uh, drew a 24 by, by 48 piece and uh, with pencil. And I cut it and then I glued it to, to the panels. Um, and then I worked, uh, worked with the pastel uh, over that already on, on the easels. Uh, and in terms of inspiration, um, when I started to think about the piece, uh, I kind of immediately thought that the natural and sort of most, uh, 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 the best approach for me would be to um, uh, have this composition um, done in, in uh, something that I, I uh, in, enjoy doing the most, which is uh, um, placing figures in the landscape and uh, kind of the minimal landscape and minimal figures and keeping lines uh, um, minimal, uh, keeping color palette minimal, sort of my favorite grays and, and reds. Um, and that, um, so that's what I ended, ended up doing, but I, I had, uh, as you can see, there are two figures that fully uh, occupy the format uh, of, the, of the panels. Uh, there is a, 
um, a standing female figure and then there is a seated uh, male figure. Um, the male figure is holding um, an, some kind of an electronic device uh, in, in his hands. It's uh, um, hinted that it's illuminated. Um, the female figure also has part of her um, head and, and uh, face uh, illuminated with uh, sort of a rectangular face that also hints at some kind of an electronic screen. Um, and I think like the, the colors in, in this work are intertwined. The, the line work here spe specifically because of this sort of narrow format, um, uh, the, the line work of the bodies uh, intertwines and I really uh, like that. I was kind of forced to do it, uh, but I find it um, very interesting. And when I was working on this, I really wanted to incorporate um, kind of a green color into, into this landscape. And I sort of, uh, interwove it into her hair. Uh, it it uh, starts at the bottom and kind of comes up uh, through the bodies and and it, uh, it's part of, um, yeah, became part of her hair. Um, and there was one other thing sort of, uh, uh, I had a hard time deciding on the title. Um, I thought poetry reading, reading poetry and um, couldn't really, um, Kind of come up, come to a, a final decision and said, well, it's poetry reading poetry. I mean, there, it, there's kind of a nuance between poetry reading and reading poetry. So I think if you combine them, it becomes. So there's a, a question from the audience and I was sort of noticing this as well, though I don't know that I noticed it as much until it was pointed out. It's, the woman almost seems uh, pregnant. Is that true or is that just us uh, seeing that? There is, yes, there is a bum. Um, I... <laughs> It's another, I have another piece I've done this and it's kind of like, yeah, you're giving it a little bit of a shape. So mm -hmm. yeah, there is a definitely kind of a- Well, your a work has idea. in person and, and incredibly, I think because of the type of paper that you used and also uh, because it's pastel, there's a certain lush quality that once again, I would encourage people to come and see the work in person. It's, it's uh, um, pretty amazing in, in person. So thank you very much. And uh, next up is, uh, I believe, Carol Jessen. Is that right? Stephen, uh, we should be moving to uh, Carol, I think, is it? Okay, I'm unmuted. <laughs> Hi, okay. <I'm> Michael. <laughs> Hi. So. Okay, so um, my work, I. First of all, I know a lot of artists found this format um, challenging. I found it a total joy to work with <laughs> because uh, for one thing, um, it just fit with what I do. I do a lot of cityscapes and um, I live in a city that has many, many hills. And so the eye sort of starts uh, right in the, the 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 front part of the image and it goes up and I was able to pull in various levels of the the city into it. Um, so in terms of uh, format, it was absolutely perfect for me. Um, I haven't actually worked in a really tall vertical format uh, quite as narrow and tall as that before, but it was really fun. And probably my inspiration for this is uh, I lived in Japan um, and I've also traveled around Asia quite a bit. And one of the things that made me want to move to Japan and travel through Asia is because I love the art so much. And I, I particularly loved when I was in uh, Taipei, I went to the Palace Museum, I, I think that's what it's called, and I was very young at the time, and I was not an artist, but I was so blown away by those tall, beautiful ink on silk paintings where you just meander up the mountain and you you see the, the mist and the fog and the, the little um, pagoda or temple up on the hillside and 
You know, I wasn't really thinking about that when I did this because it's probably just so ingrained in my head, you know, because I, I you know, I just love that kind of art. Um, so this, um, I think, is just a combination of what I do as a cityscape painter um, and the fact that I live in San Francisco that's like all hills. It just was almost like a net, it just came out very naturally for me. Um, it's just an oil painting on wood and that's how I work. Uh, so and the, the technical side of it was, you know, was what I normally do. Uh, yeah, I was interested in your artist statement when you, uh, uh, when you pointed out that people ask you what street this is and then um, it's not any specific street, it's more of a feel of San Francisco streets, even though it also, and to me also, I, I was, would normally have asked you, where is this? Uh, and it isn't. Well, that's the problem with being a representational artist, um, because, you know, I paint street scenes and people always want to know what street it is. And I tell them, well, okay, I was inspired by 22nd Street looking west. And then I was also inspired by the bay. And it's like, after you paint for a while, you just look, start combining things and putting things together. And there is no street that looks like this. You know, it's just, it's pretty much out of my head. And um, it does have elements that are consistent with a lot of your work. A lot of your work is this time of the day. Uh, right. And and there's a lot of sort of like headlights and incandescent lights, uh, you know, sparkling in your work. Is there something that about that kind of lighting that uh, appeals to you? Definitely. Um, you know, I try to like when when I used to paint paintings in the daytime, you 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 get lured into painting too many details, mm -hmm. and at least I did in the beginning. And when you paint more dusk or at night, all, all those details fall into the darkness and you just focus on the abstract shapes. And that's what I've tried to do here is pull out abstract shapes and just make it kind of exciting, you know, without getting overly detailed. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, yeah. I. So in, in your resolution of these pieces or, or this project, if you will, um, you could have chosen side by side panels uh, that worked as companion pieces as opposed to a diptych. Was there a reason why you went diptych? Um, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> I guess I have to confess it was really narrow. So I thought, you know, this way I could at least have the image have one image flow into the other image and have mm -hmm. more of a complete image well um, good i'm glad i challenged you <laughs> <laughs> yeah you did <laughs> okay so uh moving on um who do we have next oh jan uh, so next artist is Jan Nunn, and uh, she's uh, actually right there behind my uh, my left shoulder. Uh, and so um, uh, again, uh, what were the particular challenges of the format? How did you resolve those challenges? And separate from those challenges, uh, what inspired these particular panels? Okay, I've thought a lot about this, and I will try to be succinct in my in my answers. But first of all, I want to thank you so much, Michael, for inviting me to this show because it it did challenge me, and um, it challenged me in in a, a variety of ways. But one of the ways that it challenged me is because I'm probably I, I'm I'm better known as a as a, a sculptor. But, uh, but I've been thinking in the last several years about returning to my place of birth, which I was, <laughs> I would, was brought into this world as a painter and uh, was a painter for um, a, a good chunk of time until I was in college and uh, switched over to making sculpture. And I've kind of 
focus more on sculpture uh, rather than 2D work, but uh, but thinking about doing uh, doing paintings for the last several years. And this project really encouraged me to get to get serious about that and um, and return to painting. And I'm not going to abandon sculpture, but um, but I, I I, I like the interplay between between the two. So this this really gave me the opportunity to uh, to challenge myself to do that. And um, the other thing that I want to say about uh, about working between painting and sculpture is my mind works spatially, and I think that's why I was uh, I was so lured in uh, to becoming a sculptor when I was in in college. So I started thinking about uh, the imagery that I would use and the imagery that would fit into this format. And in my sculptures, a lot of my sculpture is um, uh, odd ratios, long and long and narrow or tall and narrow. And I started thinking about some of the forms that that I've created over the past um, several years, maybe maybe close to 10 years using uh, cut paper made out of microprint paper, cut and carved paper that I've been, uh, I've been fashioning into sculptures. And, uh, and so I started thinking about some of the forms that I wanted to create in these um, cut paper series that I was unable to create because they need to be symmetrical in the way that they suspend on uh, on the cables, uh, but with two dimensional work, I was able to liberate it from that symmetry, from the individual forms being symmetrical. So, um, so I I started thinking about the forms that I would use and um, and 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 how the 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 two panels would communicate. So knowing that they would be displayed in the in the gallery as uh, as a as a diptych side by side, like you see them here, uh, I needed to make them work that way. But I also wanted to be able to make them link together. So if you uh, visually stack one on top of the other, you can see that they they link either way. From uh, you can hook them together and they'll flow vertically or horizontally uh, with either one or the other at, attached at, at either end. Um, so I wanted to give also uh, the potential or the collector the potential to be able to arrange the work in the way that fits, that fits the architecture of, of the space in which they're going to be displayed. Yeah, it is interesting that uh, that uh, they're displayed this way as left and right panel, but I could also easily see the right panel as the left panel and the left panel as, as the right panel and they would sort of intersect anyways. And that's an interesting observation that you made for me um, uh, that it does reference the uh, work that I'm very familiar with of yours, uh, which is of the stacked microprint paper that's cut and that those typically have a column going down through them. And so gravity sort of makes you uh, have them hang, you know, without going every which way. And these, this gave you a little bit more liberation to go every which way. Um, somebody uh, uh, pointed out that, that they felt that it almost could be turned upside down and hung the other way. Right, well, once whoever it is buys them, then they can arrange them. <laughs> any way they want <laughs> because that was my intention i hadn't thought about them being arranged upside down but uh but that uh that could be a part of it but 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 part of the the challenge of it was to make this continuum and that that's what i was thinking of is the is is a is a continuum yeah you, as i look at it right now i could see the left panel being hung above uh, the right panel Yes, that's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So if you if yeah. you 
put the uh, the left panel above the right panel, it fits exactly. And if you put the left panel below the right panel, it fits exactly. Yeah. So they can be hung that yeah. way as a 12 inch by uh, by eight foot piece, either horizontally or vertically. Wow, I, I actually really liked the, that idea. That's great. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on at this point to uh, Eric Para. Um, and uh, uh, hi, Eric, same questions for you, welcome. Uh, what were the challenges of working in this uh, uh, narrow format for you? How did you resolve those? And separate from the challenges, what was your overall inspiration for the work? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me and uh, I'm happy to be here and answer some questions. Uh, so for me, the, like, so many, so, like so many other artists before me who've mentioned this aspect ratio, I found uh, <clears throat> pretty severe. Um, and from the moment you asked me to participate, I, I sort of embraced the challenge and I knew it would be a challenge, but I didn't really realize how severe the aspect ratio was until I got them into my studio and started gessoing them. And so I didn't really know at that point, I was trying to keep things open. I wasn't quite sure what my plan was. I wanted to get the panels into the studio and prepared. Um, and I've, I've always been kind of a, a golden mean kind of artist in which the supports I work on are rectangular, but not too severe, closer to square, but not quite square. So I'm always trying to reach for this, this harmonious, uh, getting, getting near to the idea of the golden mean. And so these panels were really severe. So as I was gestoing them, it became clear that I could put them together and make a diptych. And even though this was, you know, part of the conversation from the beginning, it, I just kind of, it didn't gel for me until they were laying down next to each other. Um, and so the image is kind of an uh, extension of this series I've been working on in which uh, I'm trying to challenge traditional notions of landscape painting, of uh, interior painting, and so I've positioned the viewer in the backyard of this house that's kind of made up. Um, the other things that are really kind of important about this work is I view the motif of reflection as, as a way to engage with this idea of self-reflection. And so I, I think about these in terms of how to get uh, the viewer, which is an extension of the community to really take a, take a moment and reflect on, on where we are as a culture. And so there's a lot of, a lot of last year was in these, um, both politically and philosophically. Um, and that comes from previous threads and previous work. Um, I think other important things to, to know are that these, again, I don't work from source material. These are all made up. Uh, they reference my by my biography of having grown up in a modernist house. And then I'm interested in a location that at once feels familiar, but in reality is, is kind of international or, or open to, to, to being representative of, of numerous places. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me. I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about, about this work and, and how it, uh, it, has a sort of fantasy feel to it, almost like uh, this could be an actual house in in the Hollywood Hills, uh, but it was rented out all the time for like a movie set, and they were making remakes of The Great Gatsby or something. And it's got that kind of uh, movie feel to it. I, I'm 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 actually really glad you brought that up um, because some of the some of the source material that I reference is. Um, architectural drawing and then staged interiors. So I'm interested in this, in this idea of a, a fantasy and, and selling a fantasy. So I like it to be a little dreamy too. Um, <laughs> One of the questions for you is like, uh, who are some of your artistic influences? Uh, uh, Edward Hopper. Um, I, uh, 
uh, Francis Bacon, uh, Bonard for color. Um, and what's that, that guy, what's his name, Hockney? Yeah, David, yeah. Yeah, it does have a, a Hockney swimming pool feel to it. Um, are, you, are your works generally without figures? Yes, so I try to paint about the human experience without actually painting the figure. I feel mm -hmm. like uh, psychologically, it's a little more interesting for me as a maker to imply the human presence and imply these narratives that are human centric, but without actually depicting the, the human form. Well, it's definitely a fantastic escape uh, into Hollywood Hills or Palm Springs or someplace like that. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, next up is uh, Marcia Sturmer. Hi, everybody. Michael, thanks so much for inviting me to this show. Um, in uh, response to your two questions, um, first off, although the physicality of this four to one ratio is ch challenging, I've actually used that ratio a lot in previous works um, in my barcode series where I do a lot of laminations um, of the resins uh, in the work. And so I guess in some ways I added another challenge uh, to that and broke away from that format. And I wanted to create um, a diptych that had a singularity to it and a very kind of powerful um, image uh, that read as one piece, um, although it could be separated out in two pieces. Um, the materiality um, was a challenge because unlike um, using the wooden panels that um, many of the other artists did, I actually hand cast these resin pillars um, out of uh, uh, and had to create the molds for them and Im embodied the uh, flowers, the natural flora within those resin pieces. And I wanted to also um, make sure that they weren't too weighty or too heavy. So, and still- I had to hang them. They were kind of heavy. They, were st they still <laughs> need to um, have, a, have a certain presence. So I also wanted to add the um, charred wood as a textural um, contrast to the kind of seductive, smooth sensation of, of the resin. So, so those elements were posed a bit of a challenge. Um, those are pretty large castings um, uh, for me to do here at my shop. So, but it was it was a great experience. And as far as inspiration, um, I have been working with kind of an inky black resin um, for about the last year. I think it uh, comes from obviously the, the area of uncertainty for all of us during the pandemic. It also, um, I think is informed by my concern with the political environment. Um, and I wanted the piece to be like a burst of spring though, through kind of the darkness of winter or, you know, seeing a new kind of light. And in fact, coincidentally, those two pieces came out of their mold on the day of the Biden um, inauguration. <laughs> so um, that was uh, kind of a good timing for that. Um, Could you talk a little bit about the use of the florals in the work? You mentioned, uh, I mean, are these actual flowers or are they? Yes, uh, they're, they're, they're actual. actual flowers. Wow. And so they were a combination of kind of spring bright light -like flowers. Um, I wanted them to flow from one panel to the other again to kind of read as one, but also be separated and have the possibility like some of the artists, other artists have mentioned um, of using them or hanging them horizontally as well. Yeah, I mean, it, you and I discussed this. I mean, my first read on this was the wildflowers coming up out of the charred landscape from the, uh, uh, from the wildfires uh, that we had in 2020 because 2020 wasn't challenging enough. And, yeah. uh, but it is interesting that the, uh, that they emerged uh, on the day of Biden's victory. That's, that's great. 
Well, it's interesting that you mention um, that the, about the wildfires because actually this charred wood, which is um, similar uh, evocative of kind of the Shosuji band technique, um, the ancient Japanese technique of preserving wood, those wood pieces actually came from burn piles um, in our attempts to um, control the wildfires uh, in a property that we have in this year in uh, Nevada's. So that uh, management um, came into play here by seeing those burnt pieces and seeing the beauty and the textural elements and how it kind of imbued this preservation and perseverance um, that I wanted to add to the work. Well, it's uh, again, another uh, piece that, you know, is, is really should be seen in person. So thank you very much. And last but not least, we have uh, Pat Whip uh, talking about her pieces. Hi. Hi, Pat. So once again, the questions are, uh, what were the particular challenges of the format? And uh, you also work in pastel, so I imagine that doubled the uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. How did you resolve them? And uh, separate from the challenges of the format, what were the inspirations for the panels? Well, we'll talk about the panels first. I thought, oh, this will be fine. It will be great. <laughs> I came and got the panels from you. I hauled them back to the studio. And then I started thinking about it because I work in dry pastels normally on like BFK Reeves, which is a printmaking paper. Sometimes I use um, mat board. And then I thought, how am I gonna do this? Just technically at the beginning, it was very difficult. And then because they're pastels, I don't generally use fixative on them. So everything has to be framed because otherwise it's, you know, it just pulls off, blows away. Um, so then it becomes a real investment. I couldn't figure out how to, if I mounted paper on the board, I'd still have to figure out how to frame it because I have to put something to protect it. It got to be a real nightmare. Anyhow, I ended up going back to Michael and saying, I can't use the boards, is that okay? And he said, yeah, it's just the, the constriction of the, the 48 by 12. So I said, okay, well, I w used rag board and did the pieces, found a framer to actually do the framing and set it back so they, it wouldn't suck up onto the acrylic, anyhow. Once I got through that, which was a difficult, I'm not a big technical person, so it was a, a challenge, but there's a part of challenges that are fun. I'm also a gardener, um, and I, I, I couldn't figure out at first what, what, what to do with these two panels. Well, I have some cannas. Where I live in Walnut Creek. I spent most of my life in San Francisco, and on the North Peninsula. So it was like exciting to be able to grow things that are very different. Mostly cannas that I've dealt with are you know, four feet tall or something. Well, I had some last year that I swear to God are eight feet tall. And they happen to be this wonderful zebra kind of pattern on them. And I'm standing there looking at them in this whole thing of a forest and being in the forest, which, ah, pillar kind of thing. I, thought, I can kind of make this work. And so that was what the beginning was. And then to, I normally work from an object that's in my studio. I was not gonna be able to either come and work from life or to haul them. So, I did a lot of drawings, worked some from slides, but that's really difficult for me. Anyhow, and then making the two of them work, there were points when I was working on these that it seemed like they needed to, somebody else spoke about pieces speaking to each other. In my head, rather than 
I, I thought they might be on either side of a doorway and sort of engulfing you so you really felt like you were in a forest mm -hmm. on either side. It is interesting to me that, uh, I mean, because what struck me, and I was very surprised when you pointed out that these were actual plants in your backyard. It just doesn't feel like California no. at all. I thought that these were made up and, you know, mm -hmm. these sort of fantastic forms that just popped out of your head. And to find out that they actually exist makes me want to visit your garden for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it is the inspiration. I mean, certainly there, there is a lot that has happened to them. I don't know that the plants would recognize themselves as it were. Yeah, somebody noticed, and I also noticed that the works really do feel like a diptych and yet the tomb pillars are not like matchy matchy. They don't line up right. to, uh, at all, but they balance very nicely. So okay. that's very interesting as well. Also, one of the challenges for me is I don't, generally don't use a lot of green and it was part of why we were, all of us I think as artists were into a challenge by the size of the work and then that leads you on to other things that are challenges so mm -hmm. it, many areas of challenges. well I love the color of these I think they're just fantastic so thank, thank you so much and thanks to all of you artists for uh, participating uh, this evening uh, the uh, gallery will be open this Saturday from 12 to 3 p.m. You do not need to be uh, have an appointment. Uh, the next artist talk is this time again next Wednesday. Uh, the final eight artists will be speaking. And uh, thank all of you for uh, uh, visiting with us this evening. Uh, and we hope to see you all again next Wednesday.